Welcome to the uh, April 6th Reparations Committee meeting. We do have a quorum. Um, if we want to go ahead and have Councilwoman uh, Christy, <laughs> if you are available to um, read the ancestral acknowledgement while you're preparing for that, I want to congratulate you for uh, your win, re-election, or election to city council to you and all of those that have won uh, for the city council and for our districts. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. I am very happy to see you returning um, because you provide such great leadership. Thank you. I'm trying to pull it up. Here we go. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. With great humility and deep gratitude, we honor the strength, endurance, and sacrifice of our Black ancestors. We honor those enslaved African people whose forced labor was exploited for generations to help establish the economy of our region and the United States. We honor those Black ancestors who persevered despite the discriminatory laws and practices that created a racial caste system legitimize anti-Black racism, and continue to plague our community today. It is only with recognition and understanding of these errors begun during our nation's origins and continuing today that we can hope, for, hope to correct our path. We acknowledge this exploitation of not only minds uh -oh, okay, and labor, but of our humanity. We grieve those Black ancestors who, despite their contribution to the city's wealth and freedom, were never recognized, fairly compensated, nor allowed to fully realize their own sovereignty. Because of their work, we are here and will invest in the descendants of that legacy. And through this process, we will work to repair some of the harm caused by the city of Evanston. We also hope our focused attempts at reparation will serve as an example to the United States government and prompt other institutional accomplices, accomplices to begin the process of repair. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Councilwoman Harris. And I'll save that comment. Next, we're gonna have a testimonial period. So this is a period where we have um, open to Evanston residents that have experienced harm or want to share um, any experience that builds the case, either our case or your case for reparation, sharing your experience, your Black live experience in Evanston. If we have anyone signed up for testimonials, we do have space for three testimony. Um, yes, we did have um, a few individuals that signed up. Um, can you call them in? I don't have the Jennifer, sign -up. Jennifer Lovett okay. is the first person. Let me see if she's there. Jennifer, I'm going to promote you to, uh, well, actually, I'm going to ask you to talk. There you go. Can Jennifer. you hear me? Yes. yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. we hear you. Okay. Um, what I wanted to uh, ask was I no longer live in Evanston, but I proved ancestry, my ancestors. Uh, I grew up in Evanston. And so I would like to know um, my status. Do I have to live in Evanston in, in order to be compensated? Which I kind of think I, I moved because I couldn't afford it. So I'd like to know um, about that. Can I be compensated even though I don't live in Evanston, but I proved my ancestry connection to Evanston? Hello? Yes, thank you, Ms. Lovett. Um, we, during our public comment, um, we actually don't have a dialogue, but the eligibility is online and those that have moved from outside of Evanston are eligible. Okay. There, there are conditions with eligibilities for those that have moved outside of Evanston. You can call Tashik directly um, to learn more details. Did you apply? Oh, yes, I applied and uh, did uh, submitted all the documents and everything, and I was approved. 
Perfect. I was approved for reparations. Um, so I'm glad to know that I don't have to live there in order to be eligible. Right. So as we continue with new programs, um, please do stay um, updated, but do reach out to, 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 to Tashik directly so that you can find out your specific circumstances. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I do uh, stay connected with her through email. Should I call her or just? No, that's stay... fine. That that's okay. fine. Thank you so okay. much. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there any other testimony, or yes. is there any testimony? Thank uh, you. Brenda Brown um, is next. Thank you. Bring into the room. Brenda, can you unmute? Brenda? Okay. Um, Diana Martin is next. Uh, I don't see Diana Bar Martin. Um, Charlene Nimal is next. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, I basically had um signed up to uh to 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 you had some committees that you were talking about um, you know, and so okay. i i would like very much to 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 engage in some activities that will bring our diverse communities together the people that are throwing rocks the people that don't understand i've been in communication with these diverse groups for a long time but i think that i uh i, I can accomplish that i've done those kinds of things in the past and we don't need to be using your energies to be sidestepping all this negativity i want to help to address that. Thank you so much for uh, coming with a solution to what is our probably biggest challenge in work that is already complicated. So uh, when we get to that part of the agenda, which is a little bit later, I'm going to propose that we do have a community unity committee in addition okay. to these others. And I would Thank love you. for you to take some leadership in that, but we'll get to that later. Okay. Thank you so much as always. Um, I don't see Mr. Bennett Johnson, nor Judy Malik, um, nor Paul Brandon. So that is all uh, for testimonials. Thank you. And so um, what I'd like to do is clarify, again, the, the purpose of this testimonial. It's very different than public comment. This is the time when we want to hear from what your Black experience has been in Evanston, why we should be doing this work and any reason why we should expand this work, any way that you wanna share uh, your black experience in Evanston that has led us to um, a, a road to repair. And that is the purpose of this. Other comments and recommendations are very welcome. Those are at public comment, which at, is at the end of the meeting. So thank you for that. Next, we have approval of our meeting minutes. Uh, I, I move approval of our February 2nd Reparations Committee, committee me Meeting Minutes. And Second. excuse me, I'll, I'll move them both together. I'll move approval for February 2nd and March 2nd, 2023 Reparations Committee Listening Session Minutes as well. Second. Okay. Um, committee Member Lockhart? Yes. Uh, committee Member Sutton? Aye. Committee member Alderman Simmons. Aye. Councilman Bavaris. Aye. Committee member Barber. Committee member Barber, you're mute. Can she so give? So sorry. A so sorry. Uh, uh, I. I had just such a problem with my with unmuting. Sorry about Thank that. Aye. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, the the motion uh, passes. Minutes pass. Now we have some items for discussion. 
Uh, first, we're going to have the amendment to the restorative housing program. Yeah, so it was on the agenda just to review the motion that um, took place and staff did have uh, a, a clarifying question in regards mm -hmm. to the amendment. And so the program was designed to be narrowly tailored to deal with the past housing discrimination. Um, so staff was wondering, will the cash payments be unrestricted and related to housing? So thank you for the question. Um, I think that it is important that we have a distinction between expanding or allowing for a cash benefit as an option for the existing restorative housing program and separately the creation of a cash benefit program for reparations. And so let's be clear that we're discussing the two separately because I think we've been conflating them. Uh, it is my understanding that the expansion of the restorative housing program will be in line with the exception uh, that was made earlier. And we will have an option for the uh, beneficiaries to receive cash. And I'm hoping that Council Cummings is here um, so that he can engage with us in this dialogue more so we can get final clarity. And then separately, we'll move to having the cash benefit program discussion, which is yet to be created and is going to require uh, more work, more uh, reports, more research and such. Yeah, Chair Simmons, I am here. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so, yeah, staff is looking for direction after the city council voted, I believe it was on the 27th, uh, to add an option for uh, cash payment instead of uh, using it to down pay for down payment assistance, payment uh, on an existing property or to do housing repair. Now the option is instead of rejecting the benefit um, to actually get a cash payment. And so staff is wondering if that cash payment under the restorative housing program is meant to be unrestricted funds or if it's meant to be restricted in terms of it, that the cash must be used for housing uh, costs whether it be, you know, rental or utilities or whatever other housing costs, but in order to relate it to housing, um, because we that's part of what has helped us narrowly tailor this program thus far. Um, it also goes to one of the questions that was asked earlier, um, the way the housing, the restorative housing program was sort of built was to encourage people to either stay in or come back to Evanston. Um, and now with the cash payment option, we would like some direction on as far as that's concerned as well. Okay. <clears throat> well, I think the direction has been given. I understand it was um, unanimous both in committee and council. Um, but, but it is my understanding to keep with your legal framework that has allowed us the success to disperse that it be a cash benefit unrestricted related to housing and not for us to um, sort of manage or dictate in what way that it's used. And as you mentioned, um, rent or, you know, furnishings or, or, or whatever, I guess that more so than our direction at this point, um, it would be nice to hear direction from you on how that would be framed on the uh, application. And so what, we, what we've also said as a committee is we don't want <clears throat> any unreasonable uh, oversight that it should be up to the recipient to use with how they choose. Uh, but from your department, is it necessary to have some sort of uh, box to check on how they will use it? Can it just be that they are using this unrestricted related to housing? And it will be their prerogative for them to use the benefit however they choose without us doing any type of uh, due diligence to um, to verify that they used it in a way related to housing. You make an excellent point. I think that staff, um, we don't really have the person power 
to really police that, to be quite honest. Um, we can certainly, uh, like with all the rest of the application, I believe there's an affirmation that must be signed in terms of um, people sort of committing to the information that's in the application and, and they understand the guidelines and, and the program and such. And so we can certainly trust the recipients with the uh, with with to use it as they see fit, uh, with the understanding that it is meant for housing. But to your point, staff um, and I think we lost Chair Simmons. Staff cannot, you know, verify. We don't have the the person power to verify or even um, monitor that how that how that money is spent. So um, it would be sort of an honor system or trust. Uh, on the on the part of the recipients, even if it was quote unquote restricted, again, um, you know, having unrestricted funds for for use however they want, and then again, it'd be more so of an honor system because the staff really just can't. We just don't have the ability to follow up like that. So I got kicked off, <clears throat> but am I hearing you saying that it will be an honor system as we discuss? It it would have to be um, right. unlike. Unlike the rest of the restorative housing program, we actually have a partner and we're looking to bring in a, another person as a contractor to help manage and oversee some of that. Um, we don't have the staff to, to verify that if we gave, you know, um, uh, committee member Lockhart the cash benefit, like no one could follow up to make sure that the money was spent on, on housing needs or costs. Well, that works great because that's not what we want. I think none of us want that type of oversight. So an honor system is sufficient. And um, is there, if there's any other discussion or questions from the committee, um, I think we have accomplished that. Mr. Sutton, are you speaking? Because uh, Yeah, just a second. Uh, let me unmute here. Um, You're unmuted now. Okay, yeah. If it can't be unrestricted, then there's no need for us to discuss it. Um, I understand the concern about um, uh, especially elderly residents being uh, uh, taken advantage of. But on the other hand, I, I think the uh, sooner that we get to distributing these funds to the eligible descendants, it'll give us more credibility as, as a committee. And also uh, it will let the um, city staff be relieved of a policing policy uh, of the recipient. So unrestricted is, is, is a great way to go. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so Council Cummings or Tashik, are there any more questions regarding that? Any more clarity needed? Um, the only other clarity is with that, with the funds, the, the cash benefit being unrestricted, as I pointed out previously, the way it was, the way the program was um, designed, uh, sort of encouraged people to either stay in or come back to Evanston, uh, with the cash payment being an option, um, and the, and the funds being unrestricted. Uh, that sort of is no longer, I guess, part of the equation. I just want to make sure that the committee is uh, uh, either okay with that, or if we still want to maintain that that goal of keeping people in Evanston or, or tracking them back? Well, I would say that we are consistently saying that we're not looking to have um, give direction oversight. We're looking for an unrestricted way to deliver this with the honor system. Um, and <clears throat> with that, we're still meeting the needs of the narrow tailoring and then we can later talk about a full on cash benefit program. Okay. Thank you. Um, committee woman McFarland. Um, I have a question that I think I, um, I, I have a sense, uh, Nick, that I may have to just, just leave this with you, but I wanted to bring it before the committee because I have had a few families look for clarity where the they have um, an ancestor who is an, anticipating or has received in line to receive, you know, they're in line to receive a distribution <clears throat> who has deceased. And um, if the family is 
seeking to uh, handle that asset during the, in the, the probate process. And there are multiple beneficiaries or multiple heirs or legatees. Do they all have to agree on? So in other words, that, that benefit would be split between say two or more people. Do they all have to agree? Is there some way other than the cash option to apportion it? Um, you know, I, did, I didn't have a definitive answer for that question. And I don't know if, Nick, that's something that you'd need to do further, have the further thought and research on. I'm going to hold that question until we get to, that's actually on the agenda, uh, more discussion, uh, committee member on heirs yes. and probate yes. and so on. So we can definitely yes. respond to that then. Is there any other uh, questions or feedback regarding the amendment to the restorative housing program? Okay, moving on for discussion to the creation of a reparations cash benefit program. This is uh, separate from the restorative housing program. Council Cummings, if you want to inform the committee, I know we've seen it in writing and heard it on the types of reporting you would like to see for us to move forward with discussion, um, understanding. And if you also want to give some brief background on why there is more due diligence needed and more information needed from us to move forward with that. Sure. Um, so I'll start with the, the last point um, in terms of why more information is necessary. So one of the one of the cases that we utilize the law department utilized in working with the early subcommittee um, re requires that in order to have race based or race conscious programming from a municipality, you need to have sufficient evidence to show uh, of, of the necessity for your for your remedy. And so we we have sufficient evidence of city of Evanston policies and practices either both with the research that was provided to us for our restorative housing program, as well as the city's e-plan, quite frankly. Um, what we don't have is the research to show um, that a cash benefit uh, would, would, would be a narrowly tailored remedy to uh, remedy that those, those harms. And so what uh, the sort of research that we would need is, to, is an ability to quantify those harms to a dollar amount. Now, I don't necessarily expect that the city would ever to be able to ever afford whatever dollar amount that gets assigned per per resident, right? But at least we would have the evidence to say, you know, Evanston discrimination caused, you know, this much harm to this dollar amount, however many thousands of hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars it might be. Um, so then the committee can then make a decision or, you know, we can create a, a cash benefit program that says uh, out of the reparations fund, we can pay uh, Evanston residents and their and their uh, descendants uh, cash uh, without actually having to overcome the hurdle if we were ever challenged in court that you don't have the sufficient evidence. Um, and, and one of the cases that really the seminal Supreme Court case that I relied on that was the reason why the city, it was the city of Richmond that tried to create a program that their program was thrown out because they just simply didn't have evidence or sufficient evidence that they needed. So that's, I would like us to be able to try and get that evidence to quantify what those harms, um, you know, equate to. I know it's very difficult to try and quantify what kind of harm that is, but if we had some number associated with it, uh, I think we would be on solid footing to create a cash benefit program. Sorry about that. Thank you, Council Cummings. I know I've reached out to um, one of our partners to help us connect with someone that could provide a report like that. Um, I think you have started your process as well. Um, do you need any additional support from the committee or other resources at this point? There are a ton of institutions that have been um, offering support, in-kind support. Um, intellectual, you know, thought partners, academics, and, and other professionals. Um, do you need any other support from the committee at this time to get that report? Not at this time, but, um, you know, I would like to, uh, once we actually have that work completed, and, you know, I've, I've worked with you, I've worked with um, Howard University to try and get some resources 
uh, once we have that information, I would like to bring it back to the committee so then we can actually design a program and so the committee can make a determination or recommendation what the dollar amount should be for each uh, Evanston resident. Awesome. And then make there, that recommendation to city council. Is there any uh, discussion from the committee? So it takes work. I mean, even to get to this initial restorative housing program, there's a ton of work, research, and um, that work has to be done. So Council Cummings, in the event um, the com committee could be more helpful or you're having any roadblocks, please let us know so that we can be helpful as well and we can move forward with this. Absolutely. And then we have for uh, discussion item number 3C, uh, when we started this work, we initially had uh, community working groups that were working on our three areas of uh, harm that we're looking to remedy. And it's not just housing, that's where we started because a community led us there. It also includes economic development and educational initiatives. And we really should return back to that because the work can't be done just on this committee alone. We have to continue community engagement. So I wanted to um, recommend that we reestablish those working groups uh, with a committee member that is chairs, but community members, and it could also be um, experts beyond the community that are working on these three areas. Um, I don't know if Indana is in the meeting, but she was um, one of the faithful early participants of those working group meetings and some others. Um, if we can open that up for discussion and then maybe have volunteers from the committee on who would like to chair or lead uh, each of these three working groups with a new one, I'm recommending uh, Community Unity. We can discuss the name. I'm not married to the name. We call it whatever we want. But to Ms. Charlene's uh, point on disinformation, division, uh, disagreement, how we can respectfully move forward towards repair, understanding that our paths may be different and not ideal, but we do have to move forward uh, with consensus and it would be helpful to do it uh, peacefully and in unity. And so we'll start with economic development working group. Do we have a committee member that is interested in leading that working group? And we're proposing five to seven community members the, the, uh, the working group lead from the committee will set the meeting. You'll have staff support to set the meeting. So it'll be based on a time that you choose your meeting cadence and um, five to seven members of the working group from, from the community. Uh, and that's up for discussion if you'd like to have more. I, I'm happy to uh, chair that, uh, Robin. Thank you. And um, then next, do we have someone interested in sharing the housing working group? I know we have established our first initiative and maybe we will continue it. Maybe there's other ways to complement it. This one in particular has um, an opportunity to pull in community. We get volunteers that reach out and ask, you know, can they work on someone's home? And so maybe we put together some sort of database for folks that want to volunteer their time, labor, materials to recipients of reparations. Um, but there's still plenty of work to be done as it relates to housing. This group will probably be lead in working with the initiative that we're gonna hear about later from Sue Lobuck at Connections for the Homeless in partnership with some of our city staff on uh, zoning equity. Yeah, I'm happy to um to chair that one thank you and then, thank you and then lastly we have educational initiatives working group and i don't have to chair but i'm going to um definitely volunteer to work with mr sutton did i see mr sutton as chair on that one yes can i can i assist you on that one i'll follow your lead no <laughs> so and we're gonna work to like to Start from being in higher education at Open. I'd love for the collaboration. Perfect, perfect. So we will um we will work together on that one. A lot of opportunity there. Um, and I'm thinking kind of beyond uh, traditional curriculum um, yes. in other senses for community education. 
And before oh, we definitely. before oh. we move on, I see Council Cummings hand. I want to make sure that it's we're not out of order. You have some questions about this. Not at all. I just under the educational initiatives, and I know that that was a, a key piece when we went to the community before uh, with the town halls and such. And I just wanted to ask or ensure that we are applying the appropriate amount of pressure to our educational partners, because the city itself, and we're dealing with a case with that right now, um, is separate and apart from District 65, District 202, are uh, the taxing bodies that deal with the community college, um, or I'm sorry, the the other the higher educational entities in, in town. So I just want to make sure that there's appropriate um, pressure being applied uh, to those entities as well as we try and move forward to bring about um, that restoration. I hear you loud and clear, and that's fully uh, my agenda for joining this uh, committee. Um, thank you for making that point. And Councilwoman Harris? So first I'll acquiesce to uh, to Sheik. Her hand was up first. Oh, so I'm gonna... okay. yes. Sorry to Sheik, I didn't see your hand first. Oh, no worries. Uh, regarding the volunteers, do you want to create like a simple application process or would it be open to anyone that want to volunteer? So I think that like our committee meetings, um, they will be, I'm recommending anyway that they are open meetings, but we should have a working group like we have this committee or this board. Um, so I would recommend that whoever's chairing a working group allow them to be open meetings. Uh, no, but there for, should... for the, the the actual working group members to create the working group. So I, I think we should create a Google Doc where people can apply. We don't want to be overwhelmed. Too many cooks end up you don't get work done. So I do think we have to funnel that process, but it should be run as an open meeting once that team is established. Yes, that's what I'm saying. So Tashik, I'm recommending that not to reinvent any wheels because you already are overworked. Um, if you could use whatever committee um, sort of application process or tailor it for a working group would be ideal. And so if each of the um, volunteers to chair these committees could reach out to Tashik at some point with some type of direction, if you're going to lead in sort of recommendations of background or anything like that. You'll definitely need to get to her, um, your meeting times and, and all of that information. And Tashik, I'm hoping that this is something that uh, the interns that you are um, working with can support you in. Yes, they will. Perfect. Um, committee member Lockhart, is that a new hand? Yes. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to uh, volunteer to work with Councilman Burns on housing. Um, I am very concerned about, you know, the homeless and what's going on in our neighborhood, especially in the Fifth Ward and the whole city, really. So I just want to volunteer for that. Thank you. And then Councilwoman Harris, did you finish your comment or there's more on this matter? No, I just wanted to say yes, I, I follow it with Council Cummings, that it's so important that we engage all of the educational opportunities, apprenticeships, the community colleges, our four-year institutions, 20265, even our private schools that fall outside of those, that we all come to the table and figure out this education. So that was it. Thank you. Awesome. And then lastly, we had the uh, community unity that's completely on the fly impromptu. We call it what we want. Um, but there is, is there someone that is willing to work with Ms. Charlene in convening our community? And I would just lift up as a recommendation that that community uh, reaches out to our interfaith community as a potential partner in um, facilitating or being involved in that process. Fair Simmons. Yes. Just briefly, um, committee member Lockhart reminded me of something, and I just wanted to remind the committee members to be very careful if you um, want to work on the working groups that no more than two of you work on the same working group at the same time. 
Otherwise, it will trigger our trigger our open meeting act requirements and your working groups will need to be noticed and there's minutes and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you for that. So we have already triggered a potential issue with the education initiative working group. And so what I'll do is um, committee men Sutton, I will um, wait to hear from you if there, if you or Councilwoman Harris are unavailable and I could attend. Um, I'll be that backup person and I'll give my written recommendations so that they can be included. Uh, Council Cummings, there's no issue with that? No. Okay, so we'll do that then. Thank you so much. Question, um, the community unit unity, is that a, another working group? Yes, another working group. Okay. And I don't think we had a volunteer yet for that. Okay, in the absence of the volunteer with step four, but if somebody else wants to do it, I don't need to do two. So, but if, if in the you absence what, of the volunteer, I, I'll step forward. I guess I don't have a committee. I could, I could do it. I mean, I send, tend to be the center of all the, <laughs> all the hate, um, but- no, you, I'll no, do it. You don't, no, I don't, you know what, I, I think it's not a problem for me to, 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 to do that um, if the committee doesn't mind, and we can certainly try to give you a break from some of that. <laughs> and we um, could reach out to Council we can Member help. Reed. We could also reach out to Council Member Reed, who isn't here at the moment. He might yeah. be willing to participate, but that should yeah. not be you, Council right. Member so, Reed. So. Yeah, so I, I'd be... I'm happy to do the work. I'm just saying I don't, I, I'm just, anyway, I volunteer. So call me in if I could help on the commit, the other committee that you're chairing. Um, let me know. I'll, be, I'll also be your backup person on that too. Thank you. No problem. Um, so please, please, you know, share this with um, Mother Miss, I'm sorry, Miss Charlene, and um, that would be great. And so now we have a couple more points of discussion, actually one more point of discussion, and then we have communications from committee woman uh, McFarland. We have a, a partner really in Sue Lobuck and the work that she's doing with her colleagues at Connections. Uh, and they've been working on an equitable zoning project. Um, Sue, if you have to unmute yourself or get pulled in as a panelist, if you could prepare to give us an update um, this directly complements the work that we're doing on reparations because our initial um, commitment is to housing and our anti-Blackness, the racism that we've seen um, historically is still baked into current policy in ways. And we hope that the outcomes of this zoning analysis will be an expansion of our commitment, not only to reparations, but to a equitable zoning um, commitment here in the city of Evanston. Sue, are you ready? Yes, I am. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I will try to share my screen. I have a very short presentation to give you an update on what we've been doing. Uh, let me see if this will work. Yep. So uh, first, thank you for uh, having me. We're very excited about this project and it's been moving along. Um, Slowly, everything takes longer than we expect it to, but honestly, we are the ones that are setting the deadlines for it, so that is okay. Um, so uh, the objectives of our, and actually first, let me explain. Um, so I'm Sue Lulbach, I'm the Director of Advocacy at Connections for the Homeless. I head up a program called Joining Forces for Affordable Housing. And we embarked on this equitable zoning project because um, Connections can't fulfill its mission, which is to end homelessness uh, one person at a time through catalyzing and serving the community. We can't achieve that mission if there isn't more affordable housing in the community. And so Joining Forces is really focused on looking at ways to get more affordable housing 
And we have found over time that zoning is one of the biggest barriers. And so that's why we started <clears throat> working on this equitable zoning project. And the objectives of the project are to really look at whether Evanston's zoning needs to be re reformed to remove barriers to affordable housing. In doing that, we, want, we wanted to get really deep uh, input from all sectors of the community. And so part of what we're doing is exploring ways to reach people who are really impacted by some of the problems that we have in our community. And then in addition, it uh, became clear very, very early on that one of the things we're hoping to do is contribute to the repair work that's uh, being done um, to address the harms that have been caused by the city of Evanston, particularly through zoning and housing policy and practices. So that's what we are aiming for. We have a bunch of really great partners, including the city of Evanston itself. So by that, I mean uh, the mayor, the housing staff, um, uh, city manager, uh, Stowe. And so we've got really good partners there who are sitting back in some ways from the processes that we're going through, but have committed to use the results of what we're doing as input into the comprehensive planning process and the zoning reform that they are moving towards. Uh, another partner we have is ZoneCo, that is a consulting firm that uh, has expertise in zoning and is, is has their own methodology really for looking at equity and zoning. We are uh, working with the Chicago Metropolitan Agency on planning, and so they're providing some technical assistance to us both in on zoning issues as well as community outreach issues. And then we have received some funding uh, to support this work, and we're using a lot of that funding um, for compensation for the community partners that we're working with. And uh, I'll get to who those community partners are in a minute. Um, wanted to take you through what our process is. Uh, so, so far we have done what we're calling a zoning diagnostic review. And so ZoneCo, the consulting agency that we're working with um, has done a review of every line of our zoning code and looked at it just to evaluate what are the provisions in the zoning code that could be uh, contributing to increasing housing costs, contributing to racial inequity, contributing to socioeconomic inequity. And so that created the hypotheses that we are working with, that there are parts of the zoning code that are causing harm. To confirm those hypotheses and find out if they really are causing harm, we wanted to reach out to the community and learn more about the experience, particularly of the people who are, uh, we find it connections are most likely to be impacted negatively by the lack of affordable housing and some of the other restrictions that are in the current zoning code. So we had an extensive community outreach and input process that I'll, I'll tell you about very briefly. Um, we are now in the middle of analyzing the data that we gathered. We're going to have stakeholder discussions once we've gone through that first round where we can get more information from people in the community that we talk to about what they see in the data and what's important and what's interesting and what needs to be addressed. And then we're going to do a final round of analysis and hopefully have a report to roll out uh, beginning in July. And I caveat with this uh, in saying that every step we've done has taken longer than we expect, but we do put, we try to have milestones that we're aiming for so that we keep on moving. In terms of the community outreach, uh, we partnered with the community members listed here on the screen. Um, these are all groups that have deep connections with the um, people that we have found at Connections uh, come to us the most with help for housing. Those are typically households with incomes under $50,000 a year, uh, who are disproportionately people of color and disproportionately people with disabilities. 
And so all of these organizations have a deep reach into at least one of those sort of demographics within our community. Um, we also did a lot of outreach just through Connections for the Homeless's channels, uh, through the media, through the city of Evanston's normal channels. And so that's how we reached out to people. What resulted from that was that we were able to have about 500 people uh, respond to a pretty extensive survey that we did. And we had 110 people attend focus groups. And our goal was not to get a random sampling of residents. Our goal was to reach in ways that had not been done before the people most impacted by affordable housing. So we were very careful to gather demographics mm -hmm. and um, were uh, pleased that we did get mm -hmm. about 17% of the people that participated in the surveys and focus groups um, have or live with somebody with a disability. About 95 uh, survey responses were in Spanish. 30% of the survey responders are Black, and uh, a little bit over 9% of the survey, survey responders are LGBTQ+, uh, which is also a, a population that is disproportionately impacted by problems related to housing and uh, zoning. So um, we, uh, we ran into some, uh, I think we learned a lot through this community input process. We uh, know that really gathering input is labor intensive and it's expensive, uh, both in terms of time and uh, compensation is really important uh, for doing this. And so we learned a lot about doing that and have recommendations for anybody who wants to engage in that. What we're doing now is looking at the data. And our big question that we're trying to answer is, are all residents experiencing the benefit that zoning really should be providing to the community? Um, are all residents experiencing this at the same level and as much as should be? So we're looking at benefits, but in terms of well-being, just being able to meet your basic needs, prosperity, being able to grow and fulfill your potential, and then equity. Is, is everybody being able to participate to the same extent? So our next steps, um, we're gonna be working through round one of the data where we're really just looking at, you know, in terms of our different demographics, were the answers to the questions that we asked different based on the different demographics? And once we have that, which should be by the end of this month, um, we want to present some of this to key stakeholders that have really helped us with the project. So it's going to be our community trusted partners, City of Evanston, and our technical experts. And from them, we want to get more information on the direction the rest of our data analysis and reporting should go. And it's one of the things I wanted to do during this meeting today is invite um, you know, whatever selection of members from this reparations committee would like to um, be part of this stakeholder group that is doing this sort of interim review of our findings. So I will pose that to you and let you decide if you guys would like to participate in this. Um, I sort of whizzed through that. I am happy to take any questions and um, invite your participation as we move forward. Thank you, Sue, for the update. I think a uh, committee member being represented would be an excellent idea if, mm -hmm. you know, if any of us have the time to do so. Um, but I definitely have been staying updated, wanted to make sure that the committee was, and the community for that matter. Um, I would also recommend that if you have future outreach um, to partner with the committee, with our listserv, if we can get information out to the community, that might be another good resource for Great. your work as well. Great, thank you. Any other discussion from the community from the committee? No, I just I just want to thank you for for your work. Um, and it sounds like it's thorough and very thoughtful. 
if at the point of we have a product to be at a point when our, when committee participation would be useful, would you reach back out to us? Are you wanting us to kind of individually follow up with you? How I'm not clear on, yeah, you know how we would connect, how best to connect. Right, right. Um, I think we're still working out the process. So basically, what we'll be doing is scheduling meetings with different uh, stakeholders. And so what I would do is, um, you know, reach out, uh, Robin, maybe you can direct me in the right uh, direction, reach out to whatever members of the committee are interested in participating in this. Um, you know, I could send you an invitation with a couple of dates and whoever is available could attend. Um, we can schedule in other ways too, so. Let me make a recommendation for efficiency please. sake. Yeah. If you send it to Tashik, she could send it to the committee. Okay. And then the committee can respond as they are able. That sounds great. Committee member Lockhart. You're on mute. Um, just regarding the um, summary of the data about zoning, is that available in um, any report that maybe we could view? And then I wanted to know a little bit more about your plans for May and the, the meetings that you're planning to have. Sure. So um, we do have, it's on our website, but I can also send a link to Tashik to, to share with all of you. Um, there is a summary of the diagnostic review that Zone Code did on our website. And so I can share that with you. Mm -hmm. um, we do not have the results of our community input available yet. Um, that's what we'll have. We'll have the preliminary version of that available in May. And so what we're hoping to do is at the very beginning of May, schedule meetings over the next two weeks with um, uh, certainly the reparations committee with the city of Evanston staff, with uh, our community partners who helped us with the input. Uh, where we will present the data that we have so far and then have sort of a, an exploratory conversation about that data and what pieces are of interest, what pieces are surprising, where we think we want to do more analysis. So those are going to be exploratory meetings, and then we'll go back in for another month of work and drafting a report uh, and then roll that out and probably have some additional meetings. Thank you. You're welcome. I want to throw this out here, Sue. You're probably aware, uh, but there's a new North Shore chapter of NARAB. Yeah. That is so that everyone knows that is the nation's lo longest uh, standing uh, democracy and housing organization that is a uh, Black real estate or realtor sort of association. Realtors is what they're called. So just want to make sure you're engaged with that group as well. I am absolutely. The, I think the leader of that group is one of our trusted community partners who we've been working with. Absolutely. Our own cheerleader, Miss Vanessa Johnson McCoy. <laughs> I miss seeing her in person. Um, any other comment from the committee? Just want to say thank you for the work and we're all committed. So we'll get this solved some way or another. Wonderful. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Sue, for being here. Great. Thank you. And then next we have for communications, our own committee woman, Claire, if you could uh, take us through an update on the informational sessions with the families of deceased ancestors, reparations recipients. I know we've all been very concerned about this, particularly Mr. Sutton really holding us accountable um, to working with families that have um, a need in this area. Sure. Um, just to um, just to give some context, uh, I know it's been a while since <laughs> over a year since uh, my background was introduced, my professional background outside of my committee work. So I am a, a lawyer by profession, and uh, my practice specializes in estate and trusts and probate. So a lot of questions came up, particularly in probate. And I also had a, a 501c3 that 
um, called Elder Law and Wellness. That uh, and under that umbrella, I speak frequently. We used to have um, free a free clinic for low income seniors, and uh, when I was uh, heading that over well over 50% of our inquiries, and you could come in with anything, had to do with housing. And so um, looking at housing within that probate and estate context, uh, you know, something that I do. A lot of questions, um, as everyone will recall, being in these meetings have come up over time, blurred out uh, in my professional context answers. But I did realize that this, there are a growing number of people in our community and involved with the program had different questions. And so I spoke to Tashik and um, I volunteered to have a workshop of sorts um, and that was held this past um, Tuesday evening for families who were, uh, fa whose family member was, family members were on the ancestor list and had and had passed away before they could uh, take their distribution. And so I, I walked them through different questions that, you know, how do you, how does that handle, how, how do, how do we handle that and so forth. I did, I started out with doing a kind of a, um, a state administration one-on-one about how assets transfer when somebody passes and to be clear, this is a type of an asset. It's an unusual asset in that at some, and for many people is waiting to be realized, but talking with families about how to handle that. So we had a general uh, informational meeting with the families. And then I with we separated and the families came and spoke with me one-on-one -on -one so that they could speak privately and very specifically about their situation and um, I could give them some information. Um, this, I, I have to say, and I'm sure Nick would be happy for me to point out, this was not, my, my discussion with them was, is not part of Evanston's legal uh, department. Um, they didn't oversee or participate in any way. Uh, this was not part of any kind of marketing for my firm or anything like that. This was just an expertise that I had that I thought could be helpful to my community. And I speak on this all the time, so why not share it with my own community? Uh, so that's that's the way that I approach this. And we, I spoke to Tashik. Um, we're uh, putting together another one for a state general estate planning, just to give people information about that, um, because our inherited wealth for most of us particularly relates to real estate and our for, for many of us our primary residence is our uh, most uh, valuable asset so it seems particularly uh, relevant in this situation so I think people felt informed from it I was really appreciative of people who came out and heard positive comments about it so I want to thank everybody who did that and um, the information that I gave the presentation of uh, she has it uh, you know, if anybody has any inquiries uh, about that, um, can I'm sure reach out to her and get a, get a copy of that. Um, but I just wanted to to thank Tashik and the interns for putting that together, uh, and I hope that those families found that uh, helpful. And I hope the wider community, um, you know, can feel some sense of support with, you know. Our, our other community members who have various expertise and so forth, they're willing to share. So I was very happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Committee Woman McFarland Barber for your hard work on that. Mr. Sutton? Yes, I uh, thank you for this opportunity to commend both Tashik and Attorney Barber for one of the most comprehensive uh, uh, discussions that we've had and bringing many of these questions to a conclusion with remedies. But more important, I wanna thank them for the compassion and the competency that these two women uh, 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 did, uh, had uh, of the day. It was just a great to me to have the families comforted, but not only comforted, giving them the kind of information that they could move forward uh, with this. It was an excellent meeting and I cannot commend those two people enough 
it was just an amazing thing. Thank you. Thank you for those comments, Mr. Sultan. Thank you so much. Is there any other uh, comment or question? With that, go ahead. Uh, sorry to jump in. At this time, Robin, um, I did want to say that the question that I could not answer definitively because I think we're, it's still being shaped is um, how families, you know, if they were accessing this asset in a probate matter or something, you know, like that, that where there's more than one um, beneficiary, more than one heir or legatee. Um, but within the context of the housing program. So I sense that that's something that, um, Nick, we'd have to ask the law department to think about, but that was a question that came up that I didn't feel qualified to give a definitive answer. Uh, so I just wanted to mention that and to um, ask the law department uh, to, get, to give some direction on after, after they had time to, review it. Thank you. And, and Chair, I don't know if we're, we're going to adjourn next, but I did have um, one comment to make unrelated to this item. Um, no, but I'll call you for a new business before we adjourn. Uh, Council Cummings, was there any comment or you will review and be in touch either directly with attorney um, McFarland Barber or the committee. Yeah, I, we will. We would like the opportunity to to look into it, and we can also reach out to um, committee member Barber uh, to discuss and get some further details uh, for that research. Okay, thank you. And so we're going to move on to communications item number four B, and there we have um, expanded our financial reports to include our real estate transfer taxes and a treasury report, which will include what we are able to report on based on state law that is restricting us from giving a real-time update on cannabis sales tax uh, collected. And I know there's been some um, questions from the community on being able to have those real-time numbers. So we are doing what we're able to do while pushing to be able to give more. Um, so before Tashik gives this report, I just want to let the committee know that the knows already. This is more for the community. How incredibly hard uh, Tashik is um, specifically assigned to staff this among all the other things that she does um, in her role at the city of Evanston. Um, we are so fortunate to have her. Other communities doing this work have teams and are paying a whole bunch of money to contractors and consultants and PR firms and paying for folks to write talking points and all these other things are happening and we have Tashik. So I wanted to just take a moment to lift up Tashik. I saw her work particularly hard um, over this last week to meet some deadlines that will help us with a contracted person um, to help administer the reparations initiative so that we can get dollars out more quickly. So when you see Tashik in community, um, please know that she's working very, 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 very hard, along with other colleagues at the city. And now she has some interns too, um, but she's doing she's doing it all. So thank you, Tashik, and thank you for the report ahead. Thank you for that. Um, so as far as the donations received this month, um, we received forty three thousand and seventy seven dollars and twenty two cents. Um, and donations. For the real estate transfer tax, um, so far we received uh, $524,882. Um, and again, we can't, I shared the, the, the treasure report that lists the amount in the reparations fund. Um, I think it's, it's, it's placed there as a placeholder um, by our CFO because we can't give you know, reasonable statistics regarding the amount in the fund. I would say in regards to the real estate transfer tax, um, this number might change um, as staff process um, uh, the revenue received. Um, it is kind of low for this, this month. I think last year, um, the budget manager told me we were already at a million dollars, which makes sense given the, the climate 
with the high interest rates we're in. So that's all. Thank you. Are there any questions from the committee on that? So this is for action. I'd like to uh, move approval to accept and place on file this report. Second. Uh, committee member Sutton. Yeah, aye. <clears throat> committee member Alderman Simmons. Aye. Committee member Lockhart. Aye. Committee member Harris. Aye. Uh, committee member Barber. Aye. Council member Burns. Aye. Thank you. Uh, so that passes. Uh, that we we hope to have updates at our uh, May meeting regarding our process in getting to a contracted administrator, and um, we'll make sure that that is on the agenda. But know that we're working to get that accomplished as well, uh, because that's really the most important thing I think we should be talking about. We have dollars from cannabis and real estate transfer taxes and uh, ancestors that are waiting for their benefits and those that are transitioning while we uh, work towards a process. And we are working hard to accelerate resources so that we can onboard somebody to satisfy that urgent need that we have. And then council member Burns, you had new business or some additional comment before we get to public comment? Uh, yeah, and I, I think it somewhat relates to, could relate to um, uh, new staff. So I, if, if we could start there quickly and then I'll go into my comments just because that'll inform um, exactly what I say. How are we doing with bringing on more support for the program have we gone over that yet earlier on the call no, it was a little late no we didn't go over that on the call so we have uh, Tashik has some interns with very limited um availability but doing great with the time that they do have that has been supportive she has her colleagues on staff but specifically to this role um i with other community members have been able to identify a, a partner that will provide resources so that we can contract someone, um, Tashik has been able to complete and submit the application for uh, a grant so that we could do that. We all made a decision not to use our reparations dollars for staffing and other sort of administrative costs. So it's going to be necessary for us to, for you, Council Member um, Burns, and your colleagues on City Council to either identify funds so that we can administer the program or find outside funds. And so Tashik and I have been successful in finding some initial outside funds, and we believe that um, Tashik, I, I'm, I'm actually given direction now that you take the step to actually post the uh, description, the contracted job description. Um, if there is any reason why you can't, you could let us know, but I would be comfortable based on the feedback that we've had from the partner moving forward with that posting. I don't, I don't know if you could give us any idea on how long it usually takes to find a candidate to onboard them, you know, through the city's human resources department and all of that. Um, to Sheik or or Council Cummings, if anybody, even Council Member Burns, if anybody could give us any update on what a realistic timeline is for identifying a candidate and onboarding them. Yeah, so we, we post, you normally post positions for three weeks, sometimes um, up to a month, depending on the job market. Um, so, but we could definitely post post it uh, next week. Well, let me let me take that back. Depending on HR's uh, uh, capacity, we can see about getting it posted next week. Yeah, I would, I would agree with Tashik and probably estimate somewhere between uh, 60 to 90 days. Because once you actually identify the candidate, they need to be then vetted and then once they're onboarded, so somewhere in that range. Okay, great. So it is my understanding with the new cash option for the um, restorative housing program, those that opt for that, the city will make that transaction. So, and please correct me if I'm wrong. So we don't need to use SEPA or another administrator for those transactions. 
No, however, the city will need to collect um, some minor financial information uh, because it will the city will need to determine which fund uh, to disperse the, the funds from. Um, one of the sort of underlying things I think I may have made the committee aware about is uh, the tax potential tax consequences of the cash benefit um, in order to make sure that it's tax free it has to be based on need and currently the restorative housing program does not have any qualifications for need it's it's based on historical harm uh, so that it, to ensure that the benefit is actually received tax free from the federal and state government we would need to get some financial information to to qualify them um, to qualify the beneficiary to ensure that we could, we could disperse those funds from the city and then they are not taxed. Thank you. And so I want to make sure I'm hearing correctly that there is no way they can be disqualified. You just have to qualify them in terms of how it will be dispersed. Correct. Okay. Chair, quick follow up on that. I mean, what council comments, what other fund do we have? to provide these benefits other than the reparations fund? Um, the general assistance fund. And I can talk to you offline about how that could work. Okay. Yeah, I think, Chair, we may need a working group or a committee or conversations may be fine just on that because I know, um, yeah. So I'll, I'll connect with Council Cummins, you offline. Um, Following up on that, that was actually the this the second part of my uh, statement was so I've I've heard from quite a few community members at this point who are concerned um, that they uh, may need to wait for people who have lower numbers to to get through their uh, restorative uh, their housing rehab. Uh, before they are, before the 25 is either, you know, transferred because they, you know, opt for direct cash benefits. Uh, or I've also heard, heard, heard from people who, for example, uh, you know, the city may have a lien on their property uh, through the no interest defer, you know, rehab program. And all they want to do is, is have their benefit applied to that lien. Um, again, having to wait until people who have lower numbers get through their rehabs, which could take time, as we all know. And at present, we're only able to get through, I think, 12 a year through this, the partnership with SEPA. And so I guess the first question is just one for clarity is, if once when money is available, are we going to allow uh, people who opt for direct cash benefits or the other example I provided to receive their benefit as the money comes available, even if they have a higher number than someone who wants to do rehab. Um, it's, it's the first question. So I had the same questions for um, clarity. I, I did receive the answers if um, Council Cumming or Tashik want to respond or... I had the discussion earlier in the week with the same questions. Yeah, so staff is going to make it clear to individuals that want home improvement that it is going to take um, a time, month, months for SEPA to get to them. Their money will still be there, but if they are recipients that chose cash payment uh, and money's available, they will the, those funds will be dispersed. Okay, and then the, the kind of follow up to that is I think our ability, I think it would help us to get through as many people as we can, especially, as, you know, even starting with the ancestors to understand exactly, um, you know, what type of, you know, benefit um, that they're going to choose. And I think that goes back to, to just available staff to do it. So, um, Tashik, I'll connect with you offline, but I, it, I'd i love to know how long we think it, it or how long it's it takes to get through those conversations. I know up until now we've been doing in-person mm -hmm. um, 
in-person meetings with recipients because they need to sign off on on the option of their choice. Mm-hmm. Um, and so once you, I know you, I think we talked and you said you, you've done, have four of those meetings, but once you get a good cadence, I'd love to know how long those conversations are taking so that we can provide additional support to try to at least get through the ancestors to know out of that group who is all going to opt for direct cash uh, benefit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, we can report back on how many individuals we have met, met with. Um, we are trying to work um, expeditiously. Uh, but those meetings, they could take anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half. Um, the recipients, if they want to walk us through their home, show us what they want, if, they, if they're choosing home improvement, what they want to repair. Um, we also share other services that they may not be aware of that the city um, provides. So. But you got through the four in how long? A month or that's more so the number? Oh, I would say. How long, do, how long do we think it would take to get through the remaining ancestors to start? We didn't bring on another um, staff person to assist. So the four took like uh, two weeks, but that's with um, Audrey's full schedule. This other okay. person that we're going to bring on bring should have more time, even to meet with folks on weekends. And and just last question, uh, Chair Simmons, when when you said you found identified grant funding. Um, that's for one uh, contract, first, but you think we'll need more, obviously. So should the city, should we be doing something? Should the city and council be looking at? So uh, right now we, we, identi- we identify that a, um, a volunteer, not-for-profit, or it's, that wasn't a good fit for this. So we have a um, job description that was put together that we all have seen for a contractor um, that would be full-time working a full schedule. And at this point, we think that will satisfy the need even more so now because we imagine that folks will opt for cash and that'll be um, less taxing, less staff time. Uh, So right now, um, you know, pending the the outcomes of the grant, we believe that we'll be okay in that role, but there are other resources that are needed. So yes, we all need to be thinking about how we lift up the program, how do we sustain it, different revenue streams, how to fund um, administrative roles. And if we want to come up with a budget, like kind of a dreamless budget where we're not leaning so much into um, partnerships and in-kind support and all that. But yes, I mean, we we all should be looking for ways to sustain the work. And, and maybe that's what we'll do. Uh, we can come up with a with a um, a budget for what would be ideal for this program to not um, be a burden to staff and get the attention that it truly deserves. And so I'll I would plan to work with you on that, Council Member um, Burns. Would you like to work on that together? Uh, yes. Okay. Will, we'll support Great. you. So, so we'll work on that together and plan to report back at our next meeting. Is there That's anything awesome. else? Thank you. Uh-huh, perfect. With that, let's jump into public comment. Um, oh. I have the list already. Let me see here. And Robin, I had a question just before. I'm sorry, could I ask? Uh-huh. Um, and I may have missed this. I apologize. I wasn't at the last meeting. Where are we with the distribution of funds as they become available? I know we had voted on that as a committee. Right. And so where are we um, in that plan? So thank you for bringing that up. The plan has been approved. And the barrier has been staffed to deliver. And so that's why um, I've gone to find dollars so that we could get a staff person to get those dollars out because we did that with an action months ago Mm -hmm. where we could have it more on a rolling basis and not wait for these like allocations like we did the first 400,000 and so on. So that's why it's a rush to get a staff person. Thank you. Yes. 
perfect. And so it's now time for public comment. We're gonna leave our public comments to three minutes and that's a stretch because we're over in our meeting time already. Um, we're gonna start with Donna Walker. Donna, you can unmute. And then next up is gonna be Jennifer Lovett, I think may have already um, gave comment on the front of the meeting and then yes, Carol. I, I'm sorry, yes, I did, thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes, ready? Good yes. morning, everyone. I just wanted to say thank you for this meeting. Um, it answered a lot of the questions that I had already, uh, that I had. And thank you guys for elaborating so much on a lot of it. Um, this is my one question. The one question was, was, was there going to be an opportunity for more funds to come in as tax dollars say, with another dispensary here in Evanston? That was my only question. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, and we generally don't give responses at public comment, but- Oh, that's fine. Could, no, but I, that you brought up oh. a really good point. I mm -hmm. haven't been following it closely. If we could get a report next meeting on the new dispensary uh, and if there is a projected open date and any sort of projections if available on how that might accelerate receiving um, the revenue. Awesome, thank, thank you. you so much, Robin. Yep, thank you. Thank you for being here. And then next we have Carol Mullins and then Brenda Brown and Rodney Green in that order. Carol, you can unmute. Carol, you can unmute. Okay. Let's go to Rodney Green. Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for invi inviting me to the meeting. And um, two questions I have, and I'm going to keep it under three minutes, maybe less. Um, for those um, residents who become uh, elderly, they're on fixed income, they're retired or they're unemployed, um, and they are recipients of um, grandparents and parents who are who meet the criteria that you set forth for the reparations. How do they get to get receive the benefits, even if they? I know you got a lottery, but how do someone who has been here for some time get those benefits, and how soon it that come through? The second question is, um, um, oh shucks, my mind went blank. I, th I think I put up in the chat. Um, let's go with the first one first and, and see what happens. Okay, um, so so thank you, Mr. Green. It's great to, I'm so glad that you're here. Yes. Uh, are you speaking to those? Because first of all, it's we need to make it clear that this application process has closed for this initial um, okay. initiative and it may expand, that's to be determined, but mm -hmm. if they haven't applied and received a, um, a notice that notice. they have been accepted, okay. then they would need to look for future opportunities. Okay, because the, the thing was is that um, my wife did apply we never got a number or anything. We're trying to figure out why we never got a number, why she never got a number. Uh, we just left it up in the air and we're just trying to figure out how because all the documentation was sent in. It was so, possible she's in the um, descendant list. Yes. Uh, you reach out to Tashik directly and Tashik could let you know the status okay. and give you any specific details. Okay. All right. <clears throat> <clears throat> and I'm willing to work on any committee you got that may need a volunteer. Thank you. Please pick one because all of them <laughs> need one. So okay, I'll okay. pick. I'll pick one. Okay, uh, I'll I'll let them know. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then next, if we had Carol Mullins or uh, Brenda Brown or Diana Martin. Charlene is next. I'm here. Okay, hey, you go ahead. Hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. The very first thing I would like to say um, in terms of supporting my idea about bringing unity in the community is the fact that mo many people in our community would not have understood one word that was said 
it doesn't make them stupid. It just makes them part of our flock. That's where I feel I need to step in to make what you're saying understandable to our flock. That will help support um, so that I don't talk too long. I, I, I'm just going to move to something else. During a time quite when my children were younger, I have now a dormant 501c3 in Illinois that's purpose was to provide alternatives to gang activity. And during that time, I was instrumental in stopping gang violence across the gang lines and all of that. What helped me with that was my knowledge of African culture. Things that we don't even know or don't even talk about, but they are solutions that are available to help us get where we need to go. In that light, I received an email from someone I've known since 82, who was retired from the World Bank and his brother is the governor of Timbuktu. I know our history back to Genesis, which was Ethiopia. I'm saying this just to say that this is the piece of the puzzle that I'm bringing in with all of you to help this work and move forward. In terms of communication, not only are, am I speaking in terms of our Ebonic speakers and us, but the fact is, is that I am fluent in all the Romance languages. I'm, I'm fluent in three of the Romance languages and have an understanding of the rest. I'm an English speaker, and once I studied German, I could ha I have a working knowledge of the Germanic languages. Ms. Charlene, you're coming up in three minutes. You're wrapping. Oh, okay. okay, this is my last comment. All of these gifts are here for me to just play my part <coughs> in supporting and expanding the wonderful work that you all are doing. Thank you, Ms. Charlene. I see Ms. Um, Carol, you can unmute. Hi, I really don't have a comment. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, did we get to Brenda Brown, Diana Martin? Yeah, they had. Um, okay. Then we have um, Mr. Bennett Johnson and then Judy Malik. Bennett Johnson is not online. Neither is Judy Malik. Paul so Brandon and Tina Payton and, that, and, and um, Carly Butler in that order. Ms. Payton, can you unmute? Hi, good morning. I would just like to say, um, I'm glad to see we're moving for cash payment, which I always advocate for. I hope that um, the seniors can get their money expeditiously, as well as creating a new program, because we have so many people uh, dying and we don't want that before they get to enjoy the fruits of their labor. Also, I would like to make a comment about the zoning. And I hope that um, the people on the zoning as well as Connections for the Homeless looks for fair zoning in all the wards of Evanston and not just one or two wards, uh, Ward 6, Ward 7, Ward 1, predominantly white areas. And we as people should be allowed to live in all areas of Evanston and not just one or two wards. Also, it should be a clear explanation of any new requirements for cash payment from people. And maybe you want to start putting that together so people can get their information uh, ready to present to the committee. Also, is the total number uh, for the donations and the money from the city 
the total number, is that on the website? Uh, not just what it is for this month or last month, but the total number. Hopefully yeah. that is, okay. And also, um, I would like to see support for people that are still getting harassed and unfair treatment in the city of Evanston and beyond. The whole point of reparations is to repair harm. So it should be something supported by NAACP, this committee, and around the country and around the world that will intervene or stop the harms before they're or while they're being presented. Uh, there's a lot uh, of continued on equities in the banking system, housing, and many other places. So I would hope that before an event happens, like someone gets murdered, this is the only time that I see people from NAACP or uh, different um, uh, organizations step forward if someone gets murdered. Let's talk about other areas and support for our black community and our black people besides someone getting murdered. There's a lot of inequities around the world in all areas of our lives. And it is very important for the reparations committee, NAACP and all other black organizations to support black people throughout their lives. Thank you, Black Lives Matter and have a good day. Happy Easter. Thank you, Ms. Payton. And then if Powell Brandon isn't here, we'll go straight to Carly Butler for our final public comment. Yeah, Paul Brandon is not online. Hello, okay. everyone. Hi, um, quick question and then uh, a comment and then a question. So my grandfather uh, qualified as an ancestor. Unfortunately, he passed away. My dad qualified as a descendant. And during the time of the application process, we had three generations of folks in one home who undoubtedly qualified, but because I wanted to respect the rules, I did not apply. And so <clears throat> I regret not applying because so much has changed and it's taken a little while to get things going. So my question is, when will the next uh, round of applications um, come forth? When will there be another opportunity for descendants to apply? Uh, so <clears throat> we haven't opened up or determined when there'll be a new application process, but I'm hoping that your family was among those that attended uh, attorney McBar McFarland Barber's uh, workshop. And if not, um, you can contact her directly or go through Tashik if you don't have her contact to find out how your family can still have access to your grandfather's uh, benefit. Yes, they were very helpful. I was just speaking and personally for myself. I did not apply and uh, I regret not applying anyway um, just because there may have been opportunity down the line. Yeah, we will, um, those things are to be determined on when another application uh, will be opened up, if this will be expanded. And, um, you know, I, I, I encourage everyone to apply uh, when the application opens up again. And, and we've, we've heard from other residents that um, wish they would have applied and, um, we hope to do better and more about educating and informing everyone about the criteria and the goals um, and the opportunities so that we get more applications next time. We did have over 600 this time. That's it for public comments. Thank you. And with that, uh, if there are no other further comments from the committee, I would like to move adjournment. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 This meeting is adjourned. Um, at our next meeting, I do hope that we could at least, if not be reporting on our first uh, 
working group meeting that we are at least reporting on the meeting time and location and those details in case we have community members that want to participate. Thank you all and enjoy your holiday.